Research Institute, Mike Howard. Uh, good afternoon. It's, uh, it's a real privilege to, to be with you this afternoon and certainly uh, appreciate the invitation and, and also appreciate uh, the Edison Foundation for hosting this, uh, this event. I, I tell you, I don't know about you guys, but I've really learned a lot just sitting here and listening and, and, and especially going through the exhibits this afternoon and, and looking at some of the really neat innovations. So at EPRI, uh, what we do at EPRI is we, we imagine the future and help to develop the technical innovation to realize that of which we envision. And so what I'd like to do before I introduce this, this, uh, the moderator for this next panel is just tell a story about something that happened this week. For the last couple of days, I have been with about 2,000 of some of the most brilliant engineers and scientists that I've been part of in, in a long time. And we were, this meeting that was here in town, it was a technology meeting, and the focus was to look at the technical innovations that are occurring in this industry. And it's the early stage technologies. And some of the things that I saw, there were about 100 or so exhibitors, and I, as I look into the audience, I recognize a few of the people that were at this meeting, so you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, right, Paul? <laughs> you were there. As, and I look at some of the technology related to battery storage, related to power electronics, related to, to, to biofuels, and I just imagine what will the world look like 10 years from now. And I look back 10 years, and I realize that there's no way, and I'm an electrical engineer, I, you know, 10 years ago, I would not have envisioned that I would download a book off of Amazon and be able to read it on my iPad. And so this week, as I was walking through and talking with some of these scientists and engineers that are developing some of the really transformational technologies that we're going to be using in this industry, I saw this device called a lithium air battery. And I was talking to this individual about this lithium air battery. And in the discussion, I realized that what I was holding in my hand was this technology that has over 10 times the energy density of what I have in my laptop, lithium ion battery. So what I mean by 10 times, so my lithium ion battery will go about three hours. 10 times that, same size and weight, means that it will go 30 hours. An energy storage device that will go 30 hours, same weight, same size, as today's laptop battery. That's a game changer. And that's an example of some of the technology that I saw this, this week. And as we were talking about electric vehicles, I was just imagining what will it be like 10 years from now. 10 years ago, I could not have imagined my iPad or my iPhone. But as I looked at the technologies this week that I saw, and granted, it's, you know, there's still, there's manufacturability that has to be, be considered and economics of scale and so on. But as I was looking at it and then thinking, what will it be like 10 years from now? Energy storage will be a game changer. Power electronics will be a game changer. And so part of what we're going to talk about on this panel is the market transformation. What are the things that are going to change this market, this industry? And you're going to hear from some of the, and get some insights from uh, some of the panelists. But before I, before I do that, I want to introduce our moderator. And our moderator of this panel is Greg Easterbrook. And I just want to say a few words about Greg. Greg is a contributing editor of the Atlanta Monthly, the New Republic, the Washington Monthly, and is a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institute. He approaches the arc of progress with the belief that we will all benefit from the growth of technology, the spread of communication, and the rise 
of productivity. He believes that the organizations that embrace this pace of change will have unlimited, unlimited potential for success. And Greg is going to talk about some of these. Now, as I was talking to Greg a while ago, Greg is the author of not one book, but eight books. Now, I remember writing my dissertation and how long it took. I can't imagine writing eight books. I mean, I was just telling you, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty awesome. But his most recent book is called Sonic Boom. And so as I was thinking about this uh, this weekend, on my iPad, I went to Amazon and I downloaded his book in under a minute. Now, that's what we can do today. Ten years ago, there's no way I would have thought that that would be possible. That's what's possible today. Imagine what's possible ten years from now. Energy storage, power electronics, I mean, all of these different technologies that we've talked about to make us all more efficient in how we use technology, how we use electricity. That's what's going to happen in 10 years from now, and I am really excited about that. So join me in welcoming Greg Easterbrook as a moderator and speaker to kick us off. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Mike. Well, Mike, thanks for saying that you, you bought my book, latest book, and put it on your iPad. Of course, now that it's on its iPad, he can use the search feature to scan for references to electric power and, and then ignore the rest of the book. So as an author, I'm not sure I really like this, but it, it, at least he bought it. We'll take what we can. So uh, I'm asked to be brief, so let me go straight to my joke, okay? In this joke, Barack Obama, Brett Favre, and Sarah Palin all die at exactly the same moment, possibly from having lunch at the museum in uh, downtown DC. And because they die at the same moment, they go before their maker to be judged at exactly the same moment. So God is sitting resplendent on a throne of shimmering gold. And God turns to first to the president and says, Barack Obama, what do you believe? And the president stands up and clears his throat and says, I believe in change and I believe in hope. And I believe in dreams, and I believe in dreams of change, and I believe in hope for dreams, and I believe in hope of... And God says, okay, okay, we get it. You've lived a good life, come sit by my side. And then the maker turns to the Minnesota quarterback and says, Brett Favre, what do you believe? And Brett Favre says, I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I think, uh, I think, well, no, I don't, uh, I think, uh, I think, I think, does, does hell have a good team? Could you trade me to hell? And God says, actually, hell has a great team because most sports stars go there. But you've lived a good life, Brett. Come sit by my side. And then finally he turns to the former Alaska governor and says, Sarah Palin, what do you believe? And she gives him a beady-eyed look and says, I believe you're sitting in my chair. <laughs> That's a pretty good that's a pretty good one. Okay, I have, a, I have a very distinguished panel to introduce to you. I won't, <laughs> I won't read their bios because you have them in your programs. You can read them, and we're tasked to be quick and efficient. We'll do those things. But before I bring them out, I, I will say that my experience is that audience questions are better than moderator questions. We have an audience both here in the room and people watching on webcast from around the country. Urge you to start thinking about your questions now. Submit them. I'm happy to read audience questions. And now, if we could have our panelists, please. That's right. <laughs> Susan, John, Claire, and Ralph. All right. Let's start. Let's start at start at the top with a presidential question. The president has stopped talking about greenhouse for the future. The president has stopped talking about greenhouse gas regulation, has begun to talk about clean energy mandates. Are they one and the same? Anybody can take it. I don't want to call on people. It's not school. Uh, well, of course they're not one and the same, Greg. But happily, there are numerous clean energy solutions that also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and uh, first and foremost is the one that I think is the central subject of this panel which is energy efficiency. 
Uh, and it's nice having Claire next to me as the representative of one of the premier regional energy efficiency acquisition bodies in the country, because I think it was the Northwest that pioneered the concept of energy efficiency as a clean energy resource, as the functional equivalent of a power plant, which today, uh, as, as Claire knows, and she and I jointly celebrate this, uh, has uh, in 30 years displaced the equivalent of 10 giant coal-fired power plants and cut the regional electric bill by more than $2 billion a year. That's a pretty good story. So clean energy centers, same thing as greenhouse gas regulation. Everybody agree with that? I think <laughs> that when you talk about clean energy, it's more than greenhouse gases. Clean energy is how we provide electricity. And I do agree with Ralph. I think energy efficiency is a long overlooked component of that. But it also includes traditional baseload that we can do cleaner, 21st century coal, new nuclear, renewables. It also includes, though, the energy efficiency, not just in the customer's homes, but also when we talk about smart grid. One of the components people don't think about with smart grid is how much we can actually save in terms of line losses and get energy efficiency from the grid. So a clean energy portfolio, from Southern Company's standpoint, everything has to be on the table. We need a diversified portfolio. We don't need to put all of our eggs in one basket, but it's all important. And two, I think a point Ralph and I agree on also is that technological advances will provide a lot of the answers. And I think the definition of clean energy portfolio today may be very different in five years based on the technology. Technological advances in, in conservation or in production? In everything, in production, in grid, as we said before, just looking at transmission, distribution substations. If we can, and I think EPRI, Mike Howard spoke earlier, has said that we can probably save four to six percent just looking at efficiencies in transmission and distribution lines. Then you look at the customer homes and energy efficiency and all that we can save there. But then in the production of electricity. So to me, the new technological advances in energy efficiency is from beginning to end and then it circles back. There's a lot of emphasis, so let me ask you this, Claire, there's a lot of emphasis on avoiding building new power plants in the previous panel talking, talking about smart grid. Uh, we're, we're, lining up the numbers of new power plants avoided, but don't we want new power plants? New plants are cleaner than the ones they replaced, aren't they? Yes, but we don't necessarily want new power plants. What we want is more productivity for the energy we have to maximize uh, what, what we're trying to produce and to reduce the unit costs of that production. If we can get more cars or customers served from the existing plant we have, that is cleaner. If we look to zero waste or minimal waste in production or around our homes, we will have clean energy, we will have efficiency, we will have less greenhouse gas emissions. They're related, they're not equivalent. John, I assume General Electric wants to build new advanced power plants, right? That's, that's, that's your piece of this puzzle, right? Yeah. There's, there's really a balance within G. I mean, one, one aspect of G is what, what Claire said is how can we make uh, power plants more efficient with a total plant optimization type of, of strategy and, and there's a lot to be gained from that. That's one side. The other side is um, as, as, as uh, the business that I'm in in GE uh, implements more energy efficiency, as Susan said, both on the uh, grid side, which we have a tremendous opportunity for on the distribution system to lower losses. I think it was Chairman Wellinghoff in a talk a couple of years ago said if we can in improve the efficiency of the distribution system by just a couple percent, we would avoid building 42 new coal-fired power plants. So there's tremendous savings, but also energy efficiency on the consumer side. We, we have the technology and we have the communications now, which, which was the obstacle before to blanket a wide geographic area for distribution efficiency improvements. What's exciting now is um, getting in the consumer side, which is new for us. And, and what the potential is for savings there. John's boss, Jeff Immelt, everybody I'm sure knows who Jeff Immelt is, has said that the U.S. energy production industry is stuck in the year 1935, that very little meaningful has changed. And we see other industries around us changing so fast that you can't keep track of them. Why is change in energy so slow? I don't agree that it's slow. I think that, um, th for example, when we talk about smart grid, and there's been a lot of discussion about smart grid, and it is wonderful and Southern Company is taking advantage of the economic stimulus. But we've been investing in Smart Grid for 20 years. We put smart devices on our transmission lines and in some of our distribution and substations for decades, but we've continued to invest. Now, 
Are there things that we could move faster on? Absolutely, but I do not agree with the statement that we're stuck in 1935. I think you can look at some of these services we provide customers in terms of energy efficiency. When you look at, again, the new technology, you look at the, the reduction in terms of emissions, whether it's SO2, NOx, or those things. So I know that, and I am a, we use GE, they're a wonderful <laughs> supplier of ours, um, and we agree on a lot, but not that statement. Not on that statement. Others, so what, what, what year do you think we're in? Are we in like 1985? What year is power production? Like? <laughs> well, but let's not limit it to power production. For example, Greg, I, the illustration I thought you were going to use, the 30s would be great if we were talking about incandescent light bulbs, which of course are 125-year-old technology. But it was grand to see, uh, John, that uh, GE, Sylvania, and Philips have now rolled out the first significantly improved incandescent technology in 125 years. Right. The spur for that, of course, were the federal lighting efficiency standards adopted by large bipartisan majorities in 2007, which some have been questioning recently. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a rather wonderful illustration of just how effective and productive these standards can be uh, to remember that GE, Sylvania, Philips, and others uh, have created new in incandescent technology. If you want to stay with incandescent, you can. It looks the same. It's the same shape and there are thousands of American workers making them. Uh, that kind of innovation, that kind of retooling, is part of what a 30-year tradition of efficiency standards has brought us, a tradition that, ironically enough, was begun by Ronald Reagan right, right. as governor of California when he authorized the first state efficiency standards, and then followed up by then-President Ronald Reagan when he signed the National Appliance Energy Efficiency Act of 1987. But we have two separate things going on at once. We have efficiency standards for products, light bulbs, air conditioners, and so on. And we have state and possibly federal level portfolio standards for utilities. Are these things in conflict? Do they have anything to do with each other? I think they work together very closely, or at least they can, and they have the potential for that. Federal standards now, as many of you know, are on a very condensed schedule because there are uh, probably 80 standards that need to be promulgated within the next 18 months to come up to the time frames being required. Those standards, once implemented, will greatly assist the utilities to meet the efficiency components of their portfolio requirements. 80 standards? On what, what's, what's the range, Claire? Well, it's equipment in the home, appliances for residential and commercial building mm -hmm. applications. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what you mean by the range question. Well, people are familiar with light bulbs, air conditioners. Almost everything in your house or your office has been improved over the past 30 years by efficiency standards at the state and federal level. Mm -hmm. But this gets into your earlier comment that the power industry is slow. Part of why efficiency is forecast to meet 85% of new demand and load growth in the Northwest is because efficiency is ever-changing. Every time we get a new app, there's a more efficient potential application of it out there. Every time we get a new um, piece of equipment, there is a way to make that more efficient. And until we stay on the cutting edge of those technologies and improvements in the utilization of them, we won't be capitalizing on all of that efficiency. In the next 10 to 20 years, where's the focus going to be? On individual homes or on businesses and factories, retail, et cetera? I think, I think really it's going to be um, in two places. Um, several, not just one, but several market researchers just recently have said that in the next three years there's going to be a, a drastic shift in the spending on smart grid from uh, predominantly metering. Mm -hmm. and, and so much so lately that a lot, of, a lot of folks in the industry think of smart grid as smart metering, only smart metering. Mm -hmm. and it's much, much more than that. But these market researchers have said in the next three years, so a very short time frame, predominant spending will shift from metering into the distribution system hmm. and more of a focus on efficiency uh, and reliability. So I think one end is on the grid itself and particularly on distribution. And with efficiency, the other will be on the customer side. And Claire mentioned uh, the standards. You know, we, um, together with uh, George Arnold and Paul Santalala and, and myself, we're, uh, you know, we're working with the NIST, the NIST effort right. on standards, mm -hmm. and I, I chair that governing board for NIST. And we identified um, 25 key standards and 50 additional standards. So there's about 75 mm -hmm. existing standards before we write anything new that govern everything from, you know, the power plant 
to the home. So, uh, but the primary thing is we've, we've got a mechanism in place where when a gap, when we identify a gap and, and we need a new standard, we have a mechanism in place where we can get that done in six months, 12 months, 18 months, and the normal time frame has been about four to five years. But Everyone, before we talk can, about standards, you have to look at the technology and the utility industry working with the Electric Power Research Institute has been working on a lot of technologies that, that really don't get a lot of play. Let me give you an example in the okay. customer's home, end-use technologies. There's a tremendous amount of work done in lighting that is goes well beyond CFLs, LED, plasma, induction, that's 50 to 80 percent more um, efficient. Other things are things like um, uh, heat pump water heaters, uh, geothermal heat pumps, ground source heat pumps. There is work now, and I can tell you one of the companies that I've been working with, we had identical schools, footprints, 54% more cost efficient. They actually saved that much more money mm -hmm. on their HVAC because they went with the ground source heat pumps, which are being perfected by a lot of the research that the utility industry itself is being a big part of, along with a lot of the smart grid working with suppliers like GE. But I say that to say that I think that you know, the discussion about mandates or standards is you've got to talk about technology first and how do we get the technology out there that does leapfrog. I know that uh, Mike Howard, when he was introducing us, and he talked about, you know, the research and what's next. Well, we have to be on the cutting edge and pushing that next technology that moves us, maybe not baby steps, but the next big leap, whether it's energy storage, whether it's usage in people's homes or businesses. Let me give you a great example APRI's involved with. When you look at big industrial drying, curing, okay. right now they are doing research on a UV drying that is over 80% more energy efficient than the existing electro technologies. Those are those big step improvements that can have huge impacts in terms of energy efficiency and savings. Plus, 40% of the power in the United States comes from commercial buildings, existing commercial buildings. And there are three primary components to that 40%. There's the shell or the envelope, there's the equipment or stuff in it, and then there's almost half of the energy use coming from behavior people in it. I think we all have a huge focus on behavior, which gets into the interface with smart grid, as well as on how do we uh, really implement deep retrofit of existing buildings and make those new buildings alive, effective, and more efficient. Claire, when you say behavior, I have three kids. I'm very concerned with behavior issues. But when, <laughs> when, when you say behavior, you mean modifying the people's The apple lifestyles? doesn't fall or? far from the tree, <laughs> <doesn't>. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the Apple reference, but um, <laughs> when, when you say modifying behavior, people's habits, whether you turn the lights off, what does that mean? Yes, but lots more than that. It's how we think about what we're using. Uh, it's how we interact with what we're using. It's being conscious of the power and the energy being consumed, and it's interacting with technology, which makes our interaction with that equipment interesting and effective and makes us want to do something about it. Do you find that you can get individual power users actually interested in these issues or do they just care about whether their bill well, goes yes, up or down? I can give you a classic market transformation example. Okay. We've, in the Northwest, we've been working on an initiative called Continuous Energy Improvement, which works with the CEOs and the corporate offices of large industrial facilities and works through trade associations. It's not until you, one, get the CEOs to incorporate energy management into corporate planning and get corporate-wide goals set. Get those goals applied and understood in relation to systems and processes and then put them in performance goals and behaviors. So if I get run over by the Wisconsin beer truck, it doesn't matter so much because the next person in my position has got to hit those goals too. That's a behavior motivator. Okay, we'll tell the beer drivers that. Um, not not uh, a lot of Wisconsin beer drivers operating in the streets of Portland, so this is not a huge <laughs> So you're probably going to... But, but, but Greg, there's, there is an important subtext here. If, if, if we are all right that there is enormous importance going forward on energy efficiency. And if I can prolong the happy sensation of NRDC and the Southern Company in full agreement for just another moment, 
<laughs> if it's true that utilities are a critical partner in this, and I agree with Susan that they are, <laughs> and that we need to integrate utility initiatives, efficiency standards, all of the tools that Claire has described to drive toward a more efficient future, it would be nice if the business model of America's electric utilities didn't rely on increases in throughput to deliver value to shareholders. And I hope an important part of the conversation today and going forward, and an important part of the reason why there is an Institute for Electric Efficiency uh, at the Edison Electric Institute, is increased attention to how we make all of this, how we align shareholder and customer interests in a more efficient electricity. Well, that, that leads naturally to the next question. Suppose consumers and businesses really got religion on energy efficiency and really got interested in the technology and American power consumption went down in a significant way. What would happen to the current utility structure? And it, so let's, let's remember the first panel today, you had utility CEOs from Detroit, Los Angeles, and Portland, Oregon, all of whom had one thing in common. They have no financial interest whatever in increased electricity sales. That's a straightforward regulatory adjustment, one of many that are under review now at the state level. Your first question, Greg, invited us all to assume that all the consequential decisions about our energy future are made in Washington, D.C. This is an illustration of the contrary. Uh, and the most important decisions about the business models for utilities going forward will be made by our state regulators, by the elected boards of our publicly owned mm -hmm. utilities. This is a critical thing they've got to grapple with because there better be, the answer to your question had better be that at minimum they're not worse off. If everyone gets religion on energy efficiency, if behavior and technology come together and we get a lot more work out of a lot less electricity, that shouldn't, be, that shouldn't make Susan's shareholders worse off if well, all of that comes to pass. One different way to look at it is, I think the one thing we do agree is that people need to use every kilowatt hour more efficiently. Absolutely. But does that mean an absolute reduction? Well, we talked about electric transportation today, didn't we? That's more kilowatt hours and less gasoline and diesel. Okay, so what you've got here is, I think it drives us, people say, well, if you're regulated, you can't be innovative. Let me tell you what I think drives innovation. If we have more efficient lighting, if we have more efficient HVAC, and every kilowatt hour they use for all of the end uses our customers use are more efficient, then we will suffer unless we're forced to find new electro technologies that also are more efficient than what they replace. The model that we prefer is let's do encourage people to use every kilowatt hour more efficiently. We want to have this new technology that reduces the curing, for example, in industrial processes, the buildings that are more energy efficient. But you know, it should be on us and our people and our, our employees and our utilities to say, what are the other things out there we can do for the betterment of society, for our customers, that are new revenue streams for us, while at the same time we're using energy more efficiently. So and we think that's I, a better business model. If the efficiency is contributing to the replacement of a power plant, I believe the utilities ought to be able to capitalize that and rate base it and earn return on that the same as they can on a power plant. Hey, Greg. I'd, we've talked about um, technology. You know, Susan talked about technology. We mentioned standards. I really think the, the success of, of what we're doing with Smart Grid is a th is three-legged stool, you know, technology, standards, and policy, right? And po we could have a very, very good technical solution, um, but if the policy doesn't support the utility investing in it, then it's, it's not going to be implemented, you know? So I, th I really think from the point of view of um, what, you know, what policy changes are needed at the state and federal level so that utilities can conserve but still be made whole at the bottom line. Okay, it's true that we have more and more loads, you know, they're using more and more electricity, but we still need, there, there needs to be major conservation efforts. Um, we, we can do voltage control off peak and save a tremendous amount of money and free up a lot of the distribution infrastructure we have in place, but the utility's not incentivized to do that today, except in a few states. And, except in a few states. All, almost all these decisions, as a question, are made at the state level, not the Washington level. And if we take President Obama as his, at his word, he's interested in getting these decisions made federally. Should decisions like this be made federally instead of at the state level? Well, I, I don't think, uh, none of us have heard President Obama say that he wants to usurp state regulatory authority over, over utilities. Well, right? He's talked about, a, he's talked about some policy goals mm -hmm. like a clean energy right. standard. But that's different from what we're talking about here. We're the fundamental business model of the American utility system. Uh, the decisions now are made at the state level. There's been no serious proposal to change that. 
That, I can tell you also that that debate has been joined in every state in the country, and there are many out here in the audience who are a crucial part of it, Greg. I think it's among the most important that are going on at the moment. I will note, for example, on the electric side, all I want, Susan, I don't, I don't know what the future of electricity consumption will be. I'll note that in 08 and 09, U.S. electricity use actually went down 5% for two years in a row, first time since World War II. I think many of us found that astonishing and certainly don't want to repeat many of the circumstances that caused it to happen, it is a reminder that it's not, electricity doesn't proceed with the growth philosophy of a kind of a cancer cell that always has to get bigger. But I just don't want the industry to have a rooting interest in more kilowatt hours. My yeah. hope is that the rooting interest of the industry is reliable and affordable service that with continuous improvement in environmental performance, let the kilowatt hours fall where they may. And the problem is that if your financial health is tied to increased throughput, which is still true, for uh, two-thirds of the states on electricity. That, I think, supplies an inappropriate rooting interest in the commodity when what Susan was talking about was really a service business, a technology business, a business about delivering increasingly sophisticated, wonderful things to people that they want and have fun with and that make their lives better. That's not a commodity business. We ought to get out of a business model that invites you to think of it as a commodity business. Well, and one thing, though, the states are very different. I mean, believe it or not, the state of Alabama is very different from the state of California. No, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> even she, in our service area, lifestyle. and I'm from Alabama. Okay. She's not so, talking about lifestyle. Um, she's talking about regulation. No, I mean, of in terms, <laughs> even in our service territory, you know, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. So I say that to say you've got to have. There are certain decisions that need to be made at the state level. Now, and Ralph, to your point, you're right. More efficiency, good for the environment. But at the end of the day, it's about the person using the electricity. It's about the customer. Within the southeast where we serve, 47% of our customers have a household income of less than $40,000 a year. So you know what? Even with technology, and I love technology, I'm an engineer, but I've got to tell you, at the end of the day, what can our customers afford for what, how they need to live? Okay, if and it's how much money can they spend on electricity when they're trying to send their children to school, those things. So that, to us, has to be a central part of the discussion. If it's about the customer, let's take an audience question on that subject. In five years, half of U.S. households will have smart meters. How will this benefit the average customer? Okay. Um, for Southern Company, for example, we have 3.3 million smart meters deployed. We will be almost 100% deployed next year. Our cost benefit was strictly based on meter reader reduction and taking trucks off the road. We were able to cost justify the entire capital investment, did not have a special ride or anything. It was totally cost justified on the savings we would have from reducing our meter reader employment and the trucks on the roads because we're, we have some very rural areas also and the gasoline, diesel, et cetera. So everything we do beyond that in terms of information, the data, the energy efficiency, energy management, is icing on the cake. And that's why we didn't have a backlash from our Public Service Commission. So our customers benefit because they get service faster, there are fewer meter reading errors, and you know what? Their cost of that part of our business is actually going down slightly. Those things sound nice, but they don't at least sound like game changers. They're not going to mm -hmm. alter my perception of how I use energy or how pay for it. Is there anything in the pipeline, John, that would alter my perception of the utility? Well, I think what Susan said is the starting point, you know, is getting the infrastructure in place, right? The smart meter and two-way communications upstream. And if that business case is strong in itself, then everything else is, is gravy on top. But really what, where the, the benefit to the consumers is, in addition to operating the utility more efficiently with the smart meters and communications, is getting the information from the meter with the usage and, in, and implementing demand response. And I think one of the, the real transforming um, you know, energy efficiency uh, programs that we're doing you know, for what, 20 or 25 years or 30 years, we've been doing direct load control, hmm. right? Where the customer says, I'll, I'll save some money, and the utility then sends a signal directly to their load, air conditioner, pool pump, electric uh, water heater. To me, it's with the smart meters now, it's getting the information and showing the c customer the usage and giving them the tools and the empowerment where they can manage their own use. Uh, to me, the, the benefits, you know, the pilots have shown significant benefits of 15, 20% on average. But um, to me, that's where- 15, 20% of what, John? Of energy use. So you could, by, by invoking, um, by, by being able to manage your own use, and, and, you know, and the complete picture would be dynamic pricing, 
so we have time of use rates, uh, sending that information down to the customer, customer being able to um, program, you know, how, how they use energy and based on the different prices, um, when do they want to, uh, if they have an electric dryer, when should that turn on and okay. things like that. Um, so you have, you have the time of use rates, you have the communication of that information uh, to the home, you have the smart meter, and then the homeowner then has all the information that they need, you know, to, to really, and they're empowered and have the tools to manage their use. The, the one caution on this, Greg, is th there was a moment when Chairman Wellinghoff was holding up his smartphone and showing all the wonderful new information that the more intelligent grid was giving him about electricity use. And one of the things, if you looked closely at the numbers, you saw something on that smartphone that is true also of the country as an average. The average U.S. electric bill is about $3 a day. And I think we have to be careful not to overstate how much effort people are going to be willing to make to more carefully manage $3 a day. Mm -hmm. What we have to try to do is do a better job. If I could, my plea here, Susan, if, if I, and your experience, I think, is perhaps, is maybe wonderful, but a little bit atypical. If the smart meters instantly pay for themselves, uh, in terms of reduced operational costs for the utility system, then the you, state regulators out there in this audience have the easiest no-brainer decision to make imaginable because they'll just let everyone roll along without authorizing any additional investment and, and look for the lower truck rolls and the fewer meter readers to pay for everything. And my sense, and I suspect we're in agreement on this too, is that the kinds of grip, grid upgrades that John is talking about are in fact going to require some significant capital investment, which will indeed be a good investment from a national perspective, but is going to require some upfront authorization. It's not just going to be an effortless move into lower cost grid technology. And I think it's probably important for someone like me, who has historically been a skeptic of big utility capital investment, to say that I agree that this is a time when utility capital investment in general is the friend of the environment, not its opponent. Friend. That I hope that state regulators will look at, at, at the whole suite of options we've been discussing. Uh, with an eye toward a willingness to entertain the possibility that what in many cases are century-old technologies could use some upgrades. And I think there will be a reliability case to make about the importance of these grid upgrades that I guess I encourage my friends in the industry to make more aggressively. I think for most people it's not more acute capacity to manage the three dollars a day but the assurance that the lights will be on more of the time and that they'll come on quicker when they go off because the utility has a much better sense of what's going on in the system and, John, as you said, a much better capacity to manage consumption in a more granular way so they don't have to just do rotating outages of whole neighborhoods when the system is under stress. So, we'll, uh, Ralph, you think we'll see environmentalists and activists supporting new power lines and, and, and major increases? You increase, are seeing increase. environmentalists and activists. I know, I know in Southern Colorado that's actually happened. But, yes, but yeah. not just in Colorado. In, in, in California, environmentalists and activists are supporting new power lines and new power generation because, Greg, you are right. In most cases, the new generation is vastly cleaner than the dirtier incumbents that it's replacing. It's the dirtier incumbents who benefit when capital investment is squelched in new technology. All I ask as we think about power generation is that we treat energy efficiency as a resource on equal terms with power generation. And we adopt a principle that now the Southern Company and NRDC adopt together, which is all cost-effective energy efficiency is the objective of the system. And wherever we can replace generation, new or existing, with lower cost energy efficiency, we ought to do it. Now, we're supposed to think about what's happening in the future here. We're talking about building new grid lines and making the grid smarter. Of course, nobody wants a dumb grid. But we're talking about big capital investments in, in, in a model that looks very similar to what we have today, just more efficient. What if the future holds decentralized power production that doesn't involve a lot of grid transmission? What happens then? Well, and I think you're right. I think, what are the next big steps? Okay, I think uh, agreeing with something Mike Howard said, I think energy storage absolutely changes the game in terms of renewables, in terms of a lot of things where you can more closely store up. And there's a lot of um, even pumped air, for example, that we can do for peak, peak pricing. So I think that's right. I think that that next big step, we're going to have to be open to that, which we are, which is our planning right now and all the utilities that are represented here do the same thing. Our planning says, okay, we may have 10,000 entries into our distribution system now because of distributed generation, cellar rooftop, top on commercial, et cetera. What's it going to look like at 100,000, 200,000, 300,000? Our electric transportation efforts that we've got, and all utilities are doing this also, how does this affect our distribution grid? The first panel talked about that. Well, our engineers are working with our electric transportation folks now to say, how much impact is this? How, what is the 
full penetration we can have of electric vehicles to the point before we have to upgrade the system. And it's better than we thought because we've made those investments through the years. So you're absolutely right. I think that, that looking forward, it could look very different from now. So how do we build optionality into our investments today? And that's not as clear cut and it's not as comfortable, but we have to do a good job of preserving those options because of that next step improvement and, and have those systems integrate with each other. And so GE's got all the answers to this, right? I'll tell you what. the. Uh you're right, Greg. Adding, adding, I mean, renewables into the grid makes it much more complex. And we have a distribution system we designed for one-way power flow from source to load. Now we're putting, we put renewables in, and now we have two-way power flow. So we have safety issues, protection issues, and even potentially congestion issues, which we've only had at the transmission system, congestion on the distribution. So, I mean, what we're doing now is, is um, new applications on the energy management system with generation transmission control. The, the advent of a new distribution management system, which we've never needed before, but we need a separate system now to manage the complexity of the distribution system. And, and, and what Ralph said with respect to it, at the generation transmission, we've always, um, and one of the speakers earlier said this was, um, maybe it was Chairman Wellinghoff that when, you know, when the load increases on a system and the frequency drops, our automatic generation control software today just ramps up the units. Well, now we'll have demand response as a negative generator. So we have, and renewables, so we have a lot more resources to optimize, and we won't necessarily, to regulate the system, just, you know, just count on the base load generation. We'll have a lot more resources available and more of an optimization that we're working on now with new software optimization um, programs, you know, on the mm -hmm. energy sure. management system. If the technology changes fast, will the regulatory framework have to change equally fast? We, we think of the regulation of, of the power industry as something that changed only very incrementally over long periods of time, but in a lot of industries, the technology has accelerated so rapidly. Could this happen in the power sector? Well, part of what we were talking about was market transformation and transformation of the market, not just in terms of distributed generation and how power is generated, but also in terms of how consumers use energy and how efficiency occurs in the market. Because it's really life after the rebate that represents market transformation for the consumer where efficiency is incorporated in what they do. And with the caveat that you ask about a vision for the uh, future of energy, the caveat that there's a very fine line between vision and hallucination. Um, <laughs> I would say that part of what we're looking for here is how do we make the business case in the commercial establishment and the industrial establishment within the home so energy efficiency isn't some big intellectual exercise where somebody's got to sit down and do all of this calculation and oh, could I save 35 cents over the month? Well, gee, honey, let's hurry up and jump on that one. But where it's simply, oh, I can do something better, faster, more efficiently, easier. And by the way, I'll have a little extra money to spend at Starbucks or, or put towards the electric vehicle or whatever it is. So I think we need to look at market transformation in terms of how energy is used as well as how power is generated and how the states and the regulatory commissions all interface. We with have that. a good question from someone in the audience, and then we'll have a closing question. If energy, if energy efficiency makes economic sense, why does it need to be mandated? I think that probably is in part for me as the representative of the nanny state. Nope, it, could trying be for, to, no, it could be for anybody here. Try, try, trying to suppress individual choice. I think what, <laughs> what we have here is uh, a 30-year history of recognizing one straightforward proposition that I think everybody in this audience involved in energy efficiency knows, which is that there are just pervasive market barriers to very fast payback opportunities. And that if you have to go after everyone at retail and reach out and try to persuade every individual, you will deny society huge economic and environmental benefits. I think that's the argument that persuaded Ronald Reagan. I hope it's the argument that will persuade this Congress because there's a track record here. You don't have to talk about this in the abstract. Did we really want to go out and try to persuade every American that the 125-year-old Edison incandescent bulb, which wastes 90% of its energy as heat, did we really need to do that at retail? Or did it make sense to set a performance standard, not to choose the winners, but to challenge the industry? 
to do better, to perform better. And I think that's a, proven, that's a proven part of the arsenal, not all by any means. We want integrated tools. We want incentives, too, by all means. We don't want to do this all with mandates. But performance standards as part of the solution, it's a 30-year it's a American success story. And I take a little bit of different view um, in that I do believe that there may be instances where it's appropriate, but I think that a mandate thing is an easy way out because I think that it is incumbent upon us to show value. Now, I will tell you that there's one of our subsidiaries has a program for 10 years that does have four different pricing and encourages you to do things like your water heating at night, dishwasher at night, and we had focus groups and we said, why do you do this? They all, 95% uh, a satisfaction. I save money. Number one, I save money. Number two, it's good for the environment. But number one was always, we save money. Mm -hmm. So what that told us was, well, you know what? We need to develop programs that help them save money and that they recognize helps them save money. And you know what? Most people, when given the opportunity to save money in a way that they don't feel like they have to sacrifice, which is why mm -hmm. I like the term energy efficiency more than conservation. Conservation, we found through our focus groups, people think that sacrifice, energy efficiency is, I'm smarter. Mm -hmm. So we've got to find ways. I do think the retail thing is incumbent upon us to go out there and say, this is good. Here's how you can save money. We can then not build a, a peaking plant, or we may be able to not have to build another plant. But at the end of the day, long term, if your customers are satisfied and feel that you're helping them have affordable and reliable power and that they are being good stewards of the, the environment and so are you, you don't have to worry about it as a utility. Let me ask you a final question. In our, in our generation, several industries have been very rapidly transformed by an unexpected technological development. Telephone's the most obvious example of that. Is there some kind of X factor out there, some coming technology in any aspect of power that's going to transform the industry? <laughs> From GE and, and, and would, you, would, you, would you tell us exactly what it is please, yeah. right, right now so we can think about our stocks? And what is its stock symbol? Right. <laughs> But, no pressure, but, while, huh? But, 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 but I don't mean solar or wind. We know about those things. Is there yeah. something else coming? I think I, th I really think the the question we hear a lot is what what will be the next killer app? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And I really think um, I think we have to look in two time frames. I think in the near term it's going to be on the distribution system because we we have the technology today. It's just that in all in all cases we don't have the policy motivator. But the business case is one of the strongest of anything we can do at smart grids. So I think it's, it's efficiency, losses, and uh, reliability of distribution. New, um, new applications that we're working on now with integrating voltage and reactive power control in ways that we haven't done before, which increase the benefits. I think in a longer time period, which means maybe a couple years, three or four years, would be um, what we're doing in, in the home with the consumer and commercial industrial customers. As we, Policy has to support that. Uh, the technology isn't all there. Uh, GE is a big company, but no matter how big you are, Smart Grid is bigger. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, we have five people full time that just look at other companies to build an ecosystem of partners for us because mm -hmm. there's gaps in in what we do. You know, so that's what makes it complicated to the customer. And is it's not just one company, but it's a number of partners that come together to put that integrated solution together. So General Electric is still not willing to admit that they're perfecting the Mr. Fusion device in their <laughs> laboratory, if you remember the Back to the Future movies. Our time is up, Free thank power. you very much. <laughs> thank you, panelists. <laughs>